Our theme last week and this week was hymns to, that you can hum and to make you go, hmm. I want us to be thinking about what we sing. Not just in chapel, but in sing time. The music that we're playing, whether it's orchestra or band, choir, the pieces that we're practicing. I want us to think about those. to admit uh, last night as I was reviewing my notes for this morning um, what I want to talk and speak to you about this morning it was like the Lord said uh, Dan um, do you do you see what you've prepared and how it applies to your own life it was kind of a it's kind of a humbling moment that though the wrong seems off so strong God is the ruler yet the battle's not done. And the battle's not done in the sense of the Monty Python line, I'm not quite dead yet, right? <laughs> it's not. The battle is not done. If you don't know Monty Python, then that's fine. What I want to talk to and address this morning is the problem of evil in this world. Dr. Shu was deeply disturbed when good thing or bad things happen to good people. It deeply disturbed him. It disturbs me too, but by observation with Dr. Shu, I think it disturbed him a whole lot more than it disturbed me. That was part of his compassionate nature. Those of you that knew who he was recognize how that disturbed him. And I think the words of this, this uh, song are words that he readily identify, identify with on a regular basis. So I want to try and address the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Do you ever wonder, what, what just happened? When something bad happens to you, or you see it coming over the horizon, you go, what did I do to deserve this? How come this happens? And yes, we live in a fallen world and we get the byproduct of other people's sins, but we still have, at least I do, do any of you ever have that in your experience, in your walk with the Lord? Raise your hand if you're only going to be honest. There are times you go, why me? Why me? Well, I kind of have good news and bad news for you, so let's start with the bad news. Open to Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. The translation doesn't do justice to the term filthy rags. It's, the word image here is pretty disgusting. I mean, really disgusting. All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is no one who calls on your name. There is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. He's recognizing the relationship between creator and creation. And all we are, the work of your hand. Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we are all your people. 
When I read passages like this, and there are other passages I could read if we had more time, <clears throat> but I realize the question is wrong. It's totally wrong. Why do good things happen, or why do bad things happen to good people? The question really should be, why does anything good happen to me who is a bad person? There's a lot of discussion about, you know, self-image and, you know, we, we can't hurt your feelings. I find it's in, as young people, and even some young people carry that on into adulthood. I find it very interesting that do, God doesn't mince words. You want to say, why has something bad happened to me because I'm such a good person? God's word is clear that left to myself, I'm not a good person. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know that intrinsically. We know that we do things that we ought to not to do. We know that we have attitudes and we respond to people in ways that are inappropriate. We respond to people in ways that are outright sin. But we kind of rationalize it because, well, I'm not as bad as, you know, Michael. He's an axe murderer. So the fact that I was nasty to Jessica and made fun of her, that's nowhere near as bad as Michael. He's an axe murderer. And we come up with all kinds of very creative, clever ways to rationalize and we convince ourselves that we're really not too bad after all. We're really basically deep down good. And scripture doesn't say that. So, this morning, when it comes to the problem of evil, we have to face, I have to face the fact that no matter how I want to rationalize it, I deserve any evil I get. I really do. In fact, it's only by God's grace that I'm not squashed more, more, by more evil that I really deserve. Now, I have a question for you. Isn't that emotionally satisfying? <laughs> Doesn't that just make you feel good all over? <laughs> In a certain sense it does because it makes me recognize I am daily casting on God's, mer God's mercy. But in a certain sense, when I'm in the middle of some difficult situation and I feel like I'm just being pounded, it's really hard to keep that perspective. And it's not really an emotionally satisfying answer to this question. So I want us to turn over to Psalm 73. Because I don't think, we are all, I, I do think we are all unique and made in God's image. But in another sense, we are not unique. We are all the same. This is a Psalm of Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, verse 1. To those who are pure in heart. Okay, so that's me, right? No. Sorry, sorry campers, not me, maybe you, not, right? But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Verse 3, for I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. That means they got lots, they got everything they need. If you're fat, in Kenya, and if you're fat in this point in time in history, that meant you were wealthy. Not that you were unhealthy, you were wealthy. Verse 5, they are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Their pride is their necklace, the garment of violence covers them. Their, eyes bulge, their eye bulges from fatness, the imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. There's an element here where Asaph is saying, wow, the evil people in this world have it easy. They're on easy street. They're wealthy because they cheat other people and take advantage of other people. And they mock them. They make fun of them. I'm envious. Any of you ever catch yourself like that? Someone who gets away with stuff and you think, wow, I wish I could do that. 
Mrs. Pinkham, and I've, I've said this to other, other camper groups, Mrs. Pinkham had as a constant prayer, and she prayed a whole lot more than I did. She's a much better prayer warrior than I am. But she prayed that when our boys did things wrong, they would get caught. One day, what, junior high, maybe it was early high school, our youngest son comes home. He is very upset and angry. He points at his mother and it says, your fault, I got in trouble today. And we're thinking, what's going on? He explained it and he said, it's your fault, mom. Other kids do that and they get away with it. DJ and I, we never get away with it and it's your fault because you've told us you're praying that we don't get away with doing things that are wrong. And mom and I just smiled and said, that's right. <laughs> and David was not emotionally comforted at that point in his life. Be very careful that we not be envious. There's something else that we will miss in this passage. Do you understand that Asaph is pouring his heart out to God? He is being very honest before God. I think one of the things that we do a disfavor to young people in the church and in the Christian community is we say, oh, you can't talk to God like that. Well, that's odd because I find it in the Psalms. I find it in this Psalm. Asaph's pouring his heart out. He is being brutally honest before God. I think God loves that when we pour our heart out to him in the midst of difficulties, even in the midst of joy, and we lay ourselves bare before him. I think he wants us to, to come to him like that. Verse 9, they have set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue parades through the earth. Therefore his people return to his place and the waters of abundance are drunk by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge with the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth. What's happening? The wicked with their mouth, besides their actions, are mocking God. Verse 13. Has this been your experience at points in your life? Surely... In vain I have kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. For I have been stricken all day long and chastened every morning. If I had said, well, I'll speak thus, and behold, I should have betrayed the generation of my children. Well, when I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight. Any of you ever have this experience? I did the right thing. And they're still picking on me. They're still making fun of me. They're still bullying me. Come on, God, that's not right. I was faithful to you, and I could have just gone along with the crowd, and it didn't seem to make any difference. And the more you think about that, the more that churns inside of you. And you say, that's not right. That's not fair. That's Asaph's heart. Until I came into the sanctuary of God, verse 17. You know, there's a popular saying, when you get to the end of your rope, hang on to the knot. Have you ever heard that? You get to the end of your rope, hang on to the knot. I don't think that's what scripture really says. Verse 17, until I came into the sanctuary of God, then I perceived their end. Surely dost thou dost set them in slippery places. Thou dost cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, thou wilt despise their form. When my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, then I was senseless and arrogant, in, ignorant. I was like a beast before thee. Asaph's coming to the realization is his life. He's beginning to start to see things from God's perspective instead of his. And he's recognizing there in 17, 18, and 19 that although it may look like they're getting away with it now and that there is no just reward for evil, God has his own timetable and perspective. And ultimately, 
ultimately there will be a reckoning before God and it will be a horrible, terrible reckoning. He's struggling in the here and now in the light of eternity to not become embittered. So, what happens? Verse 23, actually, when you get to the end of your, of your rope, God's reaching out to you. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast taken hold of my right hand. With thy counsel thou wilt guide me, and afterwards receive me to glory. See the perspective adjustment there? Asaph is adjusting his perspective to put it in line with God's perspective. He's expecting for eternity in heaven that he'll spend it with God. Verse 25, whom I have, and I, whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from thee will perish. Thou hast destroyed all those who are unfaithful to thee. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I might tell of all thy works. You see the shift Asaph makes? Now he's thinking from God's perspective. There was a point in the New Testament when Jesus challenged his disciples, okay, you want to go? Are things getting too hot for you? And one of the disciples said, Lord, where would we go? Where else would we go? And in some intrinsic small way, in their mustard seed of faith, they recognize Jesus as God, who else is there really to serve in this world? It's not just that when you get to the end of your rope, God reaches out to you, but what we forget so easily is that God has got his hand out to us the whole time. He's there the whole time, willing to help us work through this. Doesn't mean that the difficulty and the evil is going to go away. But he's there to carry us through. That's what Asaph is responding to. You know, I, I thought about this and I realized the world's response is to shake their fist in God's hand, in God's face, right? Why? Why did this happen? This isn't fair. Give me what I deserve. That's what it really boils down to. They don't really ask, they don't really understand what they're asking for when they say, give me what I deserve. Our attitude should be, Lord, take my hand. Whatever it is, good or bad, in the good times, take my hand. We're going to rejoice together. You're my heavenly father. In the difficult and hard times and when the attacks come, take my hand, Lord. I want to walk through it with you. That's hard. See, the answer to the question of evil in our lives is really a matter of perspective. Are we going to have our sinful perspective? Why me? This isn't fair. We're going to have God's perspective. You're my child. I'm not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can, can uh, handle. Everything that happens in your life is going to work towards good. Trust me. I have the proper perspective. Be conformed to my image. That means understanding and looking at things from his image, or from his perspective. God's been reaching out to us all along. Verse 28. Verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. God is right there alongside of us going through the difficult times and rejoicing with us in the good times. And for Asaph, after he poured his heart out to the Lord, and young people, if you're going through difficult situations, I encourage you, 
pour your heart out to the Lord if you know him as your Lord and Savior. He is there with his hand. Put your hand in his. Come to the same place that Asaph was at. When you struggle with wrong and evil in your life, see things from God's perspective, and then can you say, but as for me, the nearness of God is my good. That's easy for me to read. It's hard for me to live that way. But when I do, the question of evil in this world begins to recede into the background because I realize it really doesn't matter. God's got me by the hand and I'm following him and I'm totally in love with him. And that's emotionally satisfying amongst a lot of other ways that it's satisfying. I believe that that was characteristic of Dr. Shu's life. He struggled with evil. He struggled with wanting to take it back and wanting to cry out. I think there were times I saw hints because Dr. Shu was a very private person in many ways, but I think I saw hints in his life where he poured his heart out about some situation and said, Lord, this is not fair. This is not fair. This is not right. But in the end, for me, the nearness of God is my good. That's how he lived his life. I would encourage you young people to think through this, to meditate on it. Pour your heart out to God, but always come back to having God near to you. I would like us to sing now stanza 14 and 15, Randy, but I would also like us then to sing, sing the 16th stanza, stanza, and since it's only half of the actual hymn, hymnody, I'd like us to repeat stanza 16 a second time. That way it'll fit musically. As we live in the midst of a sinful world and we can't be a help but be impacted by it. Father help us to never lose perspective, your perspective. Father help our hearts not to be sad when confronted with evil as we look at things from your perspective but help us to rejoice that the heavens ring, let the earth be glad because, Father, cause it to be our prayer. For me, the nearness of God is my good. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.